Just a quick note about this episode. Bruce Miller and I recorded after it was revealed that writers and studios agreed to a new contract and had stopped picketing, but prior to writers being given permission to return to work. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Streamed and Screened, an entertainment podcast about movies and TV from Lee Enterprises. I'm Terry Lipschitz, a senior producer at Lee and co-host of the program with Bruce Miller, editor of the Sioux City Journal and a longtime entertainment reporter. Bruce, we got some good news. There is news. Uh, we have a strike over. Yay. Yay. Almost. Almost. It's not, not officially. Not all the not all the I's dotted and T's crossed, but we're, we're so close. So close with the writers. First, how good is it if we have no actors that can do the scripts that they're writing? Right. Exactly. But it could mean things like our late night programs come back. A little Jimmy Fallon, maybe. How good is it if all we get are late night programs and... And game shows. It'll be game shows galore with all oh, the man. Jeopardy champion of champions, the ultimate reality star game show. I think tonight, too, we start Dancing with the Stars. So that is not really covered by the rules, apparently, right. um, because you can dance, but you probably shouldn't talk. It is kind of quirky. There's these little carve outs here and there, you know, like broadcasters for sporting events. They're... They're members of the Actors Guild, but it's a carve out for them. And and there's other little things like that, you know, because like Drew Barrymore was coming back with her show. And then and then that got reversed because she had a couple writers that were on strike. And so they, they pulled the plug on that. But again, you know, she's an actor, but presumably now with the writer's strike ending, we'll be back at work very soon. And I think she's a producer, too. So what trumps yeah. what, you know, which right. is the highest title that you carry so it's it's good news you know it sounds like they pulled the writers uh the 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 writers guild told their membership you can stop picketing we'll get you the information we really haven't seen too many details yet come out but they just sounded very happy with it they'll send it to right. voting members it said you know like a week to 10 days and then they should be kind of back at it which on one hand gives you optimism because you think, okay, they got the writers done. Now they're going to move over and we can get the actors done. But then right before we came on to do this show, I saw that the screen actors just voted to begin a, a walkout against video game makers because they are also, there, there's actors involved with the making of video games because you've got voice actors and, and stunts and things like that that they use for you know, motion capture and all that. So it, it's, and, and a lot of the video game makers are the same act, you know, the same groups that sure. are in charge of studios like Disney and Sony Entertainment and all these. So uh, the last um, strike against video games, 2016, and it lasted nearly a year. So Ooh. a little concerning. I don't know how this will play. I think we can give up video games. I don't care. <laughs> my kids might care. Bring me the bring the acting back. That's what I want most of all. Well, we wish them well, and we hope that they reach a quick resolution on all of that because it is making it difficult for us. Yeah, well, and it makes it your job difficult because you like to, of course, talk to the actors. I'd rather talk to an actor than a producer. Would you talk to a dog? I would talk to a dog. Dogs that apparently aren't covered by the Screen Actors Guild because, I don't know if you saw this, but Paw Whoa, Patrol, what? Paw Patrol, the mighty movie, had its big red carpet premiere and 219 dogs showed up to watch the premiere because dogs will sit and watch a premiere and it set a new Guinness uh, world record. So they, that's what that's where we're at. with each other? <laughs> they, oh, man. It's, Yeah. It's gone to the dogs. Hollywood has gone to the dogs. Well, wait till they start striking. You That's know? right. I mean, imagine what they'll do. They'll bury their bones and... Or they might just all do a no walkout <laughs> and then no no walking and then they come to this and they take a dump. Right. You know? On that red carpet. Right. There you are. Yeah. I know. I know. So It's been done before, so I think we're okay. We've... Yeah, there's... Well, and then there's some... There's some programming out there that, you know, are it's, the yeah. equivalent, I guess. Yeah. But it's it's given us uh, some opportunity. There, You know, we're getting caught up on things that, because there isn't a lot of new material. There's some, 
yeah, there's some things here and there. I have started watching some new shows. There's season two of Hotel Portofino. Have you seen this one? It was on Britbox no. and now it's moving over to PBS. And it's very Downton Abbey if you're looking for something like that. It's about the family that runs a hotel and it's set, you know, many, many years ago in the 19th, 20th, early 20th century, rather, 1900s, 19, well, uh, whatever. And it's very glossy with upstairs, downstairs kind of talent and a little dirty. We'll just say that. Put that out there. And, you know, uh, interesting. So that was good. This week is the last week of Reservation Dogs on FX. If you want to see the end of that in the last episode, I cried profusely. So you have that to look forward to. I have seen the first episodes of Gen V. Now, if you're a boys fan, the boys on Amazon, where it's about the superheroes, are you familiar with this? I'm not, no. The boys, it's about a world in which superheroes are kind of the ultimate. They really run everything. And there's a group called the Seven. Homelander is the leader of the Seven. And they, they seem like, you know, very kind of noble and virtuous and looking for all the right things. Well, you realize that that's an act. That's an image that they're putting on. And behind the scenes, they're evil and vile and they're slitting everybody's throat. And there, there's a group of people who are trying to take down these superheroes. Okay. So that is the boys. Now there is a new uh, sequel series called Gen V. And Gen V is about training people to be in that superhero world. Fascinating. Fascinating. It's like a, a college drama. And they go to this um, college that they have abbreviated to God U. And they learn how to harness their powers and use it for, you know, various different crime fighting as a class. And um, in a, you see the kind of unpolished versions of their things. It's very X-Men. If you're into the X-Men, okay. that's what it's like. But one of the stars of the show is Patrick Schwarzenegger, Arnold's son. Oh. And plays this kind of golden boy. And he's the one that they all want to be. But he, he's like, he turns into fire. And apparently he doesn't wear clothes uh, because they always talk about how he is naked. <laughs> but his, his kind of temper gets the best of him. And if people are taunting him or whatever, he could be trouble. So you see that he could be another Homelander who is vile, but you don't know how this plays out in school. And I, the first episodes were great, but dirtier than you can believe. This is not something that you let your kids watch. It is not Riverdale at all. There's one woman who becomes small. She can shrink down to like the size of a, a paper clip. And she meets a kid at college who wants her to get small for various reasons. And I can't <laughs> explain them on a podcast that hopefully is going everywhere. Yeah. It's dirty, dirty, dirty. Wow. If you're looking for an adult kind of look at the superhero world, Gen V. Wow. I might, I might have to check that out. You know, I'm not a big superhero person, but something that's a little little off the beaten path yeah the boys is a good kind of entry drug with this because you get to, if you don't like superheroes you get to see how nasty they really are and so it makes you yes 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 be that bad i like that and then you've seen how they have morphed and how they're actually fighting each other to be seen as the most virtuous um it's very good and the seven always is like shifting you never know who's part of the seven on one time or not. And it's run by an evil corporation. Of course it's run by an of evil course. And they are pulling the strings on these, these poor superheroes. But now we're, we're at the college and we're trying to see how, how that all shakes down with them. So that's a new one that'll be starting very soon. And then I it just started, but I binged the whole thing selling the OC. Now, if you're a fan of those real estate shows where they also never work, Right. Um, this is one of them. The, this is a companion to Selling Sunset. And that was about the people who work in Beverly Hills in like a strip mall. And they never seem to be selling a home. They always have these listings for like $35 million, And then all they do is walk around the house and have a party there. 
And then you never hear that somebody sold this. Well, now selling the OC is a companion piece. They're in Orange County and they've got a better office, but still just as much drama. And the women all look like they're going out for some evening cocktail affair when they're in the office during the daytime. And you think, do you wear, really wear an evening gown for daytime work? And never, ever, ever shuffle a piece of paper. They're just sitting there all the time gossiping about each other. And this one guy, Tyler, is kind of a, um, a, a not necessarily a target, but a goal for many of the women there because he got divorced from his wife, who happens to be Brittany Snow, who was in a bunch of TV series in the past. And they all think they could be the new Brittany Snow. So they're all kind of like sucking up to Tyler and seeing if he would, you know, how are you feeling? Can we have a talk? I'd like, can I do a one-on-one? -on -one? Can we, can we just converse about your situation? And Tyler is like drinking it all in. He is taking all the attention. I don't think that guy has ever sold a house. If he has, <laughs> I'd like to see the paperwork because it sure isn't coming through on the show. But fascinating to watch. I binge the whole thing. And then, of course, what do we always do when we are in real estate? We have a pajama party at one of our properties so that then we can all just wear nightwear. And doesn't this kind of just open the floodgates to God knows what? I don't think I'm just going to look at you in the baby doll pajamas. <laughs> I think I might actually make a move. You know? That doesn't seem appropriate. Is, does this violate some aspect of, of like a to. realtor? There a, are there no contact? state laws against this? Because I'd sure <laughs> open up a, a selling sunset slash OC rule about you cannot fraternize with the other people in the office. It's not happening. So, uh, but it was, yeah, I binged it. That's how good it was. Okay. I had Netflix and I, uh, I just saw, oh, I'll watch one. I haven't seen one for a while. And we'll see what happens. And yeah, yeah, no property oh. sold here. Uh, I might might have to check that out. I do, you know, I, I don't mind watching some of those house selling. Like it's a little bit more house hunters. Yeah, but a house hunters unrealistic expectations. Right. The people want the two million dollar home. Right. For two hundred thousand, and they're always oh, I, we entertain, and you never see those people entertain ever. Right. Yeah. It's relatives and the real estate agent. That's who shows up. Yeah, I know. I know somebody, a former colleague, I want to say, reached out to House Hunters to see how you can get on the program. It was when she was looking for a house. And it's actually, you know, I mean, you know how this is going to go anyway, because it's there, there's obviously behind the scenes drama of how this all gets set up. But basically, they told her, you have to have an accepted offer and then we'll show you two other houses. And then you get blown away by the house, basically, that you... <laughs> That you're already, well, you yeah. You can't badmouth the ones that you aren't going to take. You just, right. I think there's possibilities. Yeah. I, you know, I like that highway one. going through the middle of our yard may be a deterrent. Maybe, maybe. But it could be making commuting easier, too. It could. And then we have easy access. Right, so right. I think we're all right. Too bad we have a lot of dogs, animals, and children that could get hit by a car in the process. But I'm keeping it on the list. Well, like you, I've been I've been trying to crush through some things before regular programming gets back to us. So Ahsoka, the uh, the Star Wars, the latest right. entry into Star Wars, been watching it with my daughter, who's also a huge Star Wars fan. This week is the seventh episode, and then uh, first week of October is already the eighth and final episode of season one. I don't recall how many episodes or how many seasons. They're planning. I don't think it's going to be, you know, eight seasons. It's going to be two or three because the, the what I've read is that they're going to take Ahsoka and then they're going to take the Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett. And they're going to marry them all together into something for movie theaters. Like there's going to be some, you know, big movie that's going to come out that's going to tie up all these storylines because they essentially take place the same timeline of the same universe. I would say that this is a good show. We've enjoyed it. The two problems that I, I have with it is if you didn't watch the cartoon Star Wars Rebels, you would be really lost with this. And I know a lot of people who kind of 
didn't really, you know, you're a Star Wars fan, but maybe didn't want to watch the cartoons because you thought, ah, it's a little, I'm a little too adult for the cartoons. And if you didn't watch those cartoons, you would really be lost with some of these characters who are in this because it basically picks up a few years after the final episode of the final season of Star Wars Rebels. But if you're a fan of Star Wars Rebels, and and a lot of people who I know who watch the show were, because it was a really good cartoon. I thought they did a really nice job with it. I think you'd be a fan of this show. The only downside I would say with Ahsoka is it feels like they're taking a really long time to kind of get to a certain point. And then we're going to go to this big like cliffhanger to season two. It just feels like, you know, we're not trying to tie up any loose ends quickly in any way. So, Fine time. Yeah. So we, you know, the big villain that they've been talking about for almost the entirety of the run so far only recently made an appearance. And, you know, you're only going to get basically two episodes out of him, three episodes. So it, it's kind of a slow build. I think it's really good. I don't know if the series is as good as Andor, which I really, really liked. But I, I might put this one ahead of the Mandalorian because I, I think really? this one might be a, you this like one might be a little yeah, yeah. It's 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 good, and it kind of gets you back to Jedi because you know the, a lot of the series that we've done, we, we've kind of moved away from Jedi and looked more kind of the ordinary people within the universe. But, but now we're getting back to lightsabers and using the force and things like that. So it's kind of fun to move back into that world a little bit. You know what I don't like about those kinds of shows is they never have a chill day. They never like say, you know, today we're not going to go out and do Jedi games. We're just going <laughs> to sit still at home and, and look at the rocks that we've got in our yard and, you know, kind of just decide what we like about ourselves. Right. They don't do that stuff. They're always on a mission for something. They are. And the missions don't go to plan. That's They never go to plan. Okay, who who drinks blue milk? What the Star Wars one is that? That was uh, the first, the original one, the Bantha milk. Come okay, on, because Bruce. they do have that at the Disney uh, parks. Yeah. You know, where they have the uh, resistance, and there's a bar there, and you can get the blue milk. And I always wondered, what would that taste like? Because I don't like milk anyway. So if you threw some blue coloring in it, does that make it any better? Yeah. Well, what is it? Does it taste like? Is it just milk with blue? No, I think it's something liquor. else. I think there's liquor in it. Oh yeah. Well, then I would enjoy that. See that? That's probably what they do. Is they're also liquored up. <laughs> they really don't know what they're what they're doing, and um, going from there. But are there more announced? Are there other Star Wars series that are coming? Or are there's pause. Yeah, there's a couple others. Um, some of them are in this kind of gray area, like the Acolyte, which is supposed to be coming out, and then another. But that one, it sounds like production has kind of been up and down, or and, and I don't, I don't know what the current s status of that one is. I know there's another season of Andor coming up, you know, another season of uh, Mandalorian coming up, but I, I don't recall offhand what the timeline of of releases is and. And also, you know, how much of it has been maybe delayed by the strikes that have been going on, too. Okay, would we ever have, like, the Adam Driver character? What was his name? Oh, he, yeah. Uh, well, he Kylo played, Ren. Kylo, Kylo Ren. Ren. Yeah. Would we ever have Kylo Ren's early years? What was he like in school? Was he real, a real brat? Or was he a good guy and then he turned bad? Or what? Well, he was Ben Solo, the son of... Uh, Han and Leia. So, right. but then wasn't he kind of like I don't know who my family is? And yep. So wouldn't he be a good one to kind of lean into? It would be fun, you know. It, it's I think there is a, and this is where the the current producers, you know, it's pay it's paying a lot of fan service. It's that kind of Luke Skywalker -y years, you know, post Return of the Jedi. And they've brought him in, you know, a couple times using CGI, CGI, making Mark Hamill look a lot younger than he is. But uh, it's, it's, I, I think, you know, they know that 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 era is something that fans are really interested in. But of course, you know, AI is is a major player because you know, unless you recast those roles, right. a lot of those characters yeah. are getting too old and they can't play themselves anymore. But you could do a high school Kylo Ren. That'd be fun. And then Kylo could be like 
maybe people pick on him too much because, you know, he doesn't really know where he belongs. He's not picking a lane. And then he turns dark. And then he realizes, oh, God, I'm into something here. I'm getting attention. I think it could be something. The could Kylo be. years. The early years of his, his career as a bad guy. Yeah. And you know prom night won't go well. There'll be something. Oh, God. It's a Carrie. It's Carrie all over again. <laughs> if it's Kylo, and we'll be mad that, you know, something. That's right. Like that. That's right. So I've been, you know, I've been watching that. Um, you know, you, you've been talking about some shows you've been watching on Netflix. I don't know if you're a baseball fan at all, but there is a really, really good baseball documentary that just came out in the last week. It's called The Saint of Second Chances. And I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Mike Vec. He's the son of Bill Vec. I know who, who he is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Bill yeah, Vec. I, we have a team here that played in the same league as his team, the St. Paul. The St. Paul Saints. Saints, right. Yeah, yeah. He's So So Mike Vec, the son of Bill Vec, who is an owner of the Chicago White Sox, Mike Vec came up with, he, he was a very innovative guy. Like, you know, if you think about, like, luxury suites, that was something that Mike Vec introduced in, in Old Comiskey Park as a way to bring in extra revenue. But he also came up with Disco Demolition Night, which did not go so well. And it pretty much drove him out of the game of baseball for quite a few years until he he was able to redeem himself as owner of the St. Saint Paul Saints. So the, the Saint of Second Chances, it kind of goes into his relationship with his father, his relationship with baseball, uh, the relationship he had with his daughter, who he brought into uh, help him as a, as a little child and then, you know, was hoping to bring up and, and continue working in the family business of baseball. And, you know, there's some emotional things that go in. I don't want to reveal too much about the story. Did he participate or not? Mike Vec, yes. Yeah, he helps narrate and and uh, very, very good story. And they, they talk with a lot of folks, too, that, you know, it wasn't just about his second chance, but second chances for other people. Like there was this one woman who all she ever wanted to do is play baseball but you know you can't let a girl play baseball right, right. because that's it's a boys game and and she was somebody who he brought in to pitch for the St. Paul Saints so they talk with her they talk with Daryl Strawberry who was a very famous baseball player who pretty yeah, much he, worked yeah, yeah he worked himself out of the game because of of substance abuse problems and he gave Daryl a second chance with the St. Paul Saints and it helped get him back into Major League Baseball. So it gets into that, that and they talk with Daryl Strawberry. So it's a really fascinating look. And if you're a fan of of sports documentaries, baseball documentaries, it's it's really, really good. And and I would definitely, you know, hop on to Netflix ASAP and check that one out. Is Bill Murray in it? Uh Bill Murray actually is sort of. He's not like I I don't recall him being interviewed but he does make an appearance in okay in it yes and where is that located where can i find that that is netflix netflix so yes we'll be looking yeah netflix i can never tell what they've got coming yeah it, it's a price i've got one coming next week i believe in theaters from netflix and then it goes in october to um uh it'll be on streaming on netflix and okay. it's called Fair play. Incredible, incredible relationship drama. Reminded me a lot of um, um, Fatal Attraction. Oh. It's about a couple who work in a trading firm. And, you know, they're, they're a couple. I mean, you see a lot of these rated R for a reason. And then he thinks he is going to get the promotion when this one guy is out. And he's all, oh, and she's all supportive and everything. And then he doesn't get it, she gets it. And then you see how their relationship changes and shifts throughout the course of their relationship. And it's fascinating. It's very much like some of the things, oh, what Emerald Fennell did a, a film a couple of years ago, she won an Oscar for it, about this woman getting back at somebody for her friend. It's a fascinating, fascinating film. The woman, I don't know who she is, B.B. Dynavore, I don't know, even know if I'm pronouncing it right, but she is very good. And she plays opposite Alden Ehrenreich. And you've seen him in a lot of things. Oh, yeah. But he never, he's in a Star Wars one. I think he's Han Solo. Yep. Yes. Was, Correct. 
he has never really gotten that kind of break that I think he deserves. And this could be it. But it is very good. It's opening in theaters. It's called Fair Play. It'll open next week. And then it's going to open on um, uh, Netflix on a streaming basis in October. Wow. That sounds good. I, I'm definitely going to bookmark. Yeah, well, look and back. I may have, too. You know, because it's, it's crazy. You get those emails from Netflix saying, coming soon. And, and you I'll go, look at the trailer. This? What is it? What is and then show? I'll... I don't know what this is. Yeah, and I'll put and it in I the remind me. Because then they'll just keep bugging me all the time if they know that I'm looking for that. You probably forgot that you did this, you know? Right. Yeah. I don't need it. What else have you seen? We're getting caught up a little bit. I mean, there's no new programs for the most part, so we're getting caught up on a few things. My wife and I, I started Painkiller, which is starring Matthew Broderick as uh, Richard Sackler, Dr. You know, from... Purdue Pharma and it kind of gets into it's another dramatization about the opioid crisis it's okay um it's yeah. first of all it's very weird watching Matthew Broderick playing somebody that old because I'm still in my mind he is he's still Ferris cool. Bueller yeah and if he's old that means I'm old and I I can't be that old yet can I can I you're really not. be that old no you're, you're, you're younger than me so that gives you a, a leg up right there so it, it's it's okay. Um, it's looking. At, it's a different perspective of the crisis. How similar is it to Dope Sick? Dope Sick with Michael Keaton, I thought was really good. I thought yeah. Michael Keaton in that was really good. But the perspective of Dope Sick was coming mostly from the doctor, the prescriber end of things, and this is more of the investigation side of things and the. Purdue Pharma side of things. Not not painting Purdue Pharma in a good light right. in any way, but it's more of how the crisis was manufactured from that end, and then it looks at some of the stories of of how they got to where they got to. I, I don't think the stories are as compelling as, okay. as Dope Sick, but it's we're we're not going to stop watching it. It's 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 a six episode miniseries. How far so are you in? Three episodes, so we're. Oh, uh, you kind of have to make a choice. Yeah, we're at that point now where I think we're we're committed and we'll we'll knock it off. And it's not, it's not bad, but it's not. I like Michael Keaton. I thought was just very good. Michael Keaton is just to me has aged very well as an actor. Like he he's picks gotten up these better. Yeah, yeah. It's not just the goofy little things he because he you know you think of him as like Beetlejuice and some of those comedies he did and. But some of the things that he's done later in life have just gotten so much better. Really good. Really yeah. good. You know, I find uh, you do get to that point where you say, do I fish or do I cut bait? And I will bail on series. Yeah. I I have had one and done. I'll watch one episode, realize this is way too much for me to invest. And when I said the first killer with those things is when it says 10 episodes. Yep. Because somewhere around seven, it wanes until we get to nine. And right. then it'll pick up and then you get the 10 and it's all right. Sometimes I have even watched one. And if I have the access to the 10, I'll watch the 10. And I yeah. won't watch the ones in the middle. Interesting. That, yeah. That might be bad. <laughs> but life's too short. And I believe that you shouldn't have to watch crap just because you made an investment initially. Yeah. there There is a couple shows that my wife and I watched like we watched a little bit of that what was it Tomorrowland on Apple TV the one yeah that, and it looked good yeah it, and it was I we didn't make it to the end of episode one and we just said nah hello we're, we're tomorrow not, hello yeah. tomorrow yep yep right and that one was like eh it's you know I can maybe see where it's going but I, I can't dig in on this one and there was another one all. too yeah I watched it all and I thought where are they going with this because I bought in in the in the beginning that it was, this is the way the world is. We are doing this. And then you realize it's a scam. Right. And they're just scamming people. And then how are they getting out of the scam? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just couldn't get emotionally invested into it. Now, there was another one that was also on Apple TV Plus where I watched the first season. My wife and I watched the season and we liked it. And then it came back for season two. But then I read that it got canceled. Because the ratings weren't quite there. And a number of the reviewers said, well, it kind of ends on a cliffhanger now, you know. So am I going to watch it or am I going to watch it? And this, it was the Mosquito Coast. And I liked Hello. 
I liked season one of the Mosquito Coast, but I, I couldn't quite figure out if I wanted to invest it. And we got hung up in that spot of like, do we watch it? Don't we watch it? We went ahead and watched it. I didn't love it, but it doesn't end on a cliffhanger. I thought it wrapped up. You know, <laughs> it was it, for me. I was done. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it got to the end. I was like, okay, we, we kind of dragged this out. The performances in season one, I thought were better. And this one is just kind of, it, it was a little too over the top. But it doesn't, I, I, it ends, like, where it ends, you're fine. Like, I was totally fine. There is that last episode. It, it is explosive. There is some drama. Some characters may or may not be with us to the very end. But it does not end on some weird cliff where you're like, they canceled it. Now I'm never going to be able to know what happens. Because it, it was, I was watch, totally fine with it. Totally. Watch the Harrison Ford movie and you got it all. Yeah, I probably got it. I, I watched that so, so long ago. I don't even remember it. You know, that's why they're remaking things is you don't remember what I happened. I don't. Like, I remember a minute and I remember watching it, but I don't I don't even remember it at this point. It was so long ago. Yeah, and they always wanted to throw in something that, well, we never thought that there would be, like, robots. And so they'll throw in a robot in a show. Not in this one necessarily. But, right. you know, you wait a minute now. This was like a 1950s movie and we changed it a little and we threw in a robot yeah what is this all about but it's just a way to cut again this may go back to the writer's strike yeah um where they just kind of take some property and twist it a little bit and then the original creator gets nothing from it right so maybe they'll be protected i hope to god that we don't see ai things i hope they're not going to be the future I have seen, though, some good AI things, I got to tell you. Oddly enough, this last week I went to see Expendables 4. Okay. I swear that was written by a computer. It had to be. It was so bad. It was so bad. It's the kind of movie that when you go to it, you think, are they reading from teleprompters? They've got to be reading from teleprompters because you wouldn't remember this crappy dialogue if you tried. Yeah. And then their eyes are darting. And you think that's got to be reading across the screen while they're looking at something. Plus which, they haul in people that you think, where did these people come from? I am not familiar with this person. I don't know if he's a big star in Korea or what he is, but apparently he's a big deal because he's in this show. So you don't yeah. know those things. And then they haul back, and sure enough, you know, it's Sylvester Stallone and Jason Statham star as the... The Expendables that we remember. Dolph Lundgren's in there too. And right. poor Dolph Lundgren has this bad wig that he wears and they reference Farrah Fawcett. And I'm thinking, who would remember Farrah Fawcett's hairdo as the reason why you would reference Farrah Fawcett? You wouldn't. You just right. wouldn't. I mean, it's it's not, it doesn't work for today. I get it, but it's bad. And then they make a bad, bad, bad joke about Stevie Wonder which I think that is not relevant today, nor is it something you would include in your movie. And then you look at the film and you see that they have so much green screen in this sucker that basically it could have been shot in my backyard. You know, there is no need for all of that. And the special effects are really unspecial. The fight scenes are very bad. It's just, it goes down a list and you think, who talked them into this? This has got to be you know, uh, clearly a money grab. And then, of course, you have the ultimate evidence that it is a money grab, and that's that it has Andy Garcia in the film. Name a decent film that Andy Garcia has made in the last five years. You cannot. But he's always in movies. He's in those book club movies. He's in all of these other kinds that, you know, he plays this kind of role. And I, I think, uh-oh, Andy Garcia's here. That should be something to tell you what's up with this. Megan Fox is in there, too, but you don't know really what. Is she an expendable? Is she really one of those people? And she turns out to be Jason Statham's girlfriend, but she has martial arts skills, so bring her with. I think she can work on this. But that's that's where you get with this stuff. You think they're writing it. It's machines that are writing this crap because it sounds too unrealistic to even buy. Nobody saw it. Nobody watched that movie. Did you, did you see it opened? It it, it it got beaten by The Nun. 
the nun too in the well, third weekend. Sure. It's yeah. sure. But um, you know, you put names like that, and whenever they have a big list of names, this goes back many, many years. If you may remember back in the sixties, Cinerama was a big thing. And oh, that yeah. would this widescreen stuff, and they would put casts of thousands in them. And How the West Was Won was one who had like every big name star there was. Then we had the disaster films that had all the big name stars in it. And now we're into that era where it's action adventure. And it's usually people who aren't good actors, but they can do a, a, a stunt or two and then have a catchphrase or throw off a good liner now and then. And so yeah. it ends up being, this is how we're putting them in there. And, uh, you know, do we need it? I don't think we need it. The, the really strange thing is my phone fell off my lap into the seat and they're recliner seats. <laughs> and I must spend a good 15 minutes digging that chair to try and find the phone that I thought was actually more action and better action than what I was seeing on the screen. People were watching you if there was actually anybody there and they're thinking, wow, this this guy over here, this is the best part of the movie. Watch this guy dig for his phone. Me. I'm digging for the phone. And I tell you, if there was $50 bills in there, I don't know. There could have been money in that seat when I started messing around. I did find popcorn, but uh, I did not need it, so that was good. And I did get the phone. Ultimately, I, I did get the phone. Well, that's good. I am laughing now thinking, though, as you bring up Andy Garcia, and the first thing that comes to my mind is his addition to uh, the Godfather trilogy. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I, he was kind of the next um, Al Pacino. Right. You know, he was going to be the heir apparent and he got great work and yeah. he did great work. But now it's like that thing where you go, who else is in this? Andy Garcia. We can Andy get Garcia. Him. Let's get Andy. So he must play well with a certain audience. And they go, oh, yeah, Andy Garcia's in it. But I think he might be the sign of a bad movie now because he's taking everything he can get and it probably isn't reading the scripts. Yep. Because I thought he was a good actor at one point. I really did. Yeah. But this this crap, oh, hoo -oh. he's he's going to do the sequel to um, Al's extra work. <laughs> he could do, instead of AI, they could use they could use Andy Garcia to play a younger Al Pacino. He's there. The you go. AG. So what do we have coming up, uh, Bruce, in our our next few episodes? I know. Got, uh, oh, uh, I've got a lot of stuff for you. I've got um, the uh, talk with the producers of Goosebumps. They've rebooted that. I have a, well, actually, we could put it on this week. So we could add it in. I'm doing it tomorrow. I'm talking to one of the actors from Hotel Portofino. Okay. If you'd like to add that. Yeah, we, we can, can slip that in. in. Yeah. Um, it's Oliver Dench. Now, that name, does that ring a bell? Oliver Dench. Oliver Dench. The name is, it sounds a little Dench. familiar. Dame Dench. Dench. It's her nephew. Yeah. Oh. He's working. And his dad was a big actor in London. Um, but yeah, and he's the, the star of Hotel Portofino. He plays the son who comes back to help run the hotel. So we've got him coming up. I've got a number of films that are opening. But again, we're going to see where we sit. If we can solve that actor strike, we're going to talk to some actors. Otherwise, you're going to get some producers, and I know you don't want that. So nope. there we go. And, and in the worst case scenario, we'll be interviewing dogs barking at us. And we'll get the dogs. We'll get I, them. Uh, Paw Patrol, coming soon. It could be good. I think it could be a good thing. All right, so we'll go now to an interview with Oliver Dench, and then we will wrap up and see you again next week for another episode of Streamed and Screened. I look at, at the things you've done in the past. What period do you really like to be in? Do you like to be in the present? Would you rather do shows that are in the present, things in the past, or things in the future? It's interesting that I don't really, I don't really think of the time period that much when I think of work. Obviously, it comes into it, and obviously, when we're shooting, there are differences like accent or or manners or general etiquette of the things, but. Those aren't really the interesting things to me. I think the things that stay more essential to it are interpersonal relationships and character. And they transcend time, really, or at least they transcend time in the kind of stuff that I would be doing and the kind of roles I would be interested in playing. I know there would be some really far out there things, really far out there characters that could only exist in sci-fi. But in terms of the things I've done, I've always played humans. <laughs> 
That's good. That's good, right? <laughs> yeah, but which is good. He seems so guarded. Is that a product of the times or is that? Yeah, um, that is something I have found interesting about this time period in particular. But I, I think that applies to all characters. I think that one in particular, a lot of what is guarded about Lucian is a product of the times, but that would come up in any period. There would be reasons why people would be suppressing certain aspects of their personality and reasons why other things would be allowed to flourish. The fact that this is happening in the 20s just means there's a different buffet of things to choose from, but he is guarded. There's a lot of pressure on him. Did you relate to him at all? Did you say, oh, I can, yeah, I, I see this, or do you go, no, that's not me at all? I've led a much more fortunate life than Lucian I did not fight in World War One, so I think there's already like a massive jump of understanding that I couldn't really realistically ever hope to um to empathize with but but sympathize with I absolutely can and I think that's sort of our job as actors there are a lot of things about Lucian that are different from me but there's obviously a lot of myself that I bring into the character and I think this is how I understand these social situations. Now I just have to layer on the different um, things that Lucian is dealing with to try and make what I hope is somewhat interesting to watch. There's a pulling him into the family business is kind of a thing. Was that the way it was with you too? You were pulled into the family business and you became an actor or was that always something you wanted to do? No, that was something. Well, it wasn't always something I wanted to do when I was very young. I had an idea that I wanted to be a marine biologist. And I don't, I, I don't know why, it seems kind of off the wall, but I've since spoken to lots of people I knew. And I think it was very in vogue when I was in my pre-teens to want to be a marine biologist because loads of people seem to have this idea. I don't know if it was like a David Attenborough inspired thing or something that was happening on the BBC in the UK at the time, but lots of people I know inexplicably wanted to study jellyfish and things. Um, I didn't end up being a marine biologist. I then wanted to be a chef for a while, but I'm not a massive fan of professional kitchens when I did like the tiniest amount of work experience in when I crumbled. <laughs> Completely ineffectual. But no, I wanted to be an actor. I don't think I was, um, I don't think I was pulled in any particular direction. So, so what appealed to you about it? Is it just the idea that you get to be different people all the time or? Well, originally it was more poetic for me and this this hasn't really been um the type of work i've ended up doing but when i i think well while i wasn't pulled in certain directions i was very lucky to have the family that i do and my granddad who was a, a shakespearean actor um on the stage i was exposed to a lot of shakespeare when i was growing up and i loved that i thought that was absolutely amazing so originally i think it was interest in text that made me want to act because I thought it was so beautiful. I thought it was amazing. It made me want to write as well, but I think acting seemed, I don't know, more immediate um, for me. And that's kind of what pulled me into it. The idea of character almost came secondarily to that, which I don't, I don't know if is how many people have kind of come into it, but that was definitely the pull for me. Shakespearean though, come on. I, I read that and I, I can glaze over very, very quickly. Yeah. How do you, you know, especially at a young age, how do you attach to that? How do you say yeah. like this, even though it's difficult to read? Well, I think, the, I mean, the first thing is it's not, it's, as, as everyone kind of says, it's not meant to be read. Um, it must be heard. So if you have someone really skillful doing it, then it's amazing. If you have someone who's not very skillful doing it, then it's the most boring thing imaginable. Oh. It's difficult. It is, it is really difficult. Um, but I was lucky to have someone who was skillful at the beginning sort of explain it to me. And then after that, it becomes, um, the more you're exposed to it, the, the, the more effectively you're able to interpret it. And that's almost a problem in its own right. I think that's often why it's so confusing is because the people who are putting on these plays often are people who are very exposed to it. So the language is very immediate for them. So they watch and they think, what's the problem? I understand every single word. I know it really well. An audience who is maybe not so exposed to it might find it more difficult to interpret. So I think that can be a problem in modern Shakespeare productions. Um, but it is true. The more you, once you get into it, the more you read. By the time you've read or watched a number of plays in a short span of time, it'll, it'll become easy. Um, it just requires doing that work, which is why it's so elitist. It can be really elitist. How difficult is it to memorize? Easier. 
much easier. Really? It is? Much easier. Well, it's, again, probably this might not be everyone's experience and some of the plays are split differently. So some of the early plays are almost entirely verse, which means they all, all the lines have rhythm or some of the early plays, almost all the lines have rhyme, which I think is actually really ugly <laughs> often. But, um, and some of the later plays are more prosaic, which means that it's more difficult to learn. But when you're learning a speech and you've got the rhythm and the rhyme to rely on, I actually find that to be a great crutch in memorizing because you know if you've got a single word wrong when you're memorizing, if you're there going, ah, oh, to me, and oh, to me, that is the question, whether it's nobler in the blah, 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 blah. You, you understand when it goes um, off, the tr off the tracks um, and that lets you know that you've messed up, whereas some other stuff, you can mumble through scenes for, for pages before you realize you've got everything wrong. Oh, one of those. Oh. You have a checklist then and you start checking off the characters that you want to play? I used to. You did? I, I used to. May, not a physical checklist, but I definitely used to think that like the most legitimizing career would be some, you know, John Gielgud like thing where you, you first play Romeo and then Troilus and then Hamlet and then blah, 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 blah kind of work your way up. Lear. Yeah, eventually you play Leah and then you die on stage and it'll be like, right. wow, what, a, what an incredible experience. Um, but I sort of, ha I had to, cause it wasn't, it wasn't what I was doing, but I sort of let go of that some years ago. Um, not to say I wouldn't still want to play those parts, but I don't necessarily think they have to be in such a linear progression anymore. I feel as though when I was young, I felt like I was running out of time to play characters that meant something for, um, to me. And in some ways that's true. Like they'll, they'll, they'll come a time where I'm less likely to be cast as Romeo. Um, but in general, I think there's such a wealth of characters, not just in Shakespeare, but in everything and other things that I hadn't really given attention to before that one could never play everything that is interesting. So, so, so doing television, does that allow you or afford you the opportunity to do theater? I mean, I, I'm assuming that it's very difficult to, to have a career in the theater these days because it isn't as financially uh, viable as it might be in television or in film. Yeah, um, it still exists in, in London in, in quite a big way. I'm not saying that it's not an issue and, uh, you know, the theatre acting in general tends to be underpaid, ma mainly because it's under um, under attended. Um, and that's a problem for people who are trying to, trying to kind of carve out a career in theatre. I guess in that aspect, doing TV does let you... Um, does give you more opportunities to kind of wait for these jobs when they come but it's also about what you're busy doing and if you're running in certain circles like i haven't had a theater i haven't i've haven't been i haven't been meeting theater people in quite a long time because i've been shooting things and that makes it difficult to have a career in theater because no one knows who i am <laughs> comparatively i know lots of people who do theater much more regularly and they find it more difficult to meet people who are organizing tv jobs is difficult. It's complicated. I think the world is so big and vast now that it's it's difficult to um, to always be doing what you want when everything fits. A, a Broadway actress told me that when she went to Hollywood, she realized that she was so stiff that she had no emotions because she was afraid she would be too broad on oh, yeah. What was it like when you first tried to do something on camera? Was it like, oh my God, I got to watch so I'm not like blinking. I have to watch so I'm not <laughs> moving. I kind of, I've been through in the things I've done so far, which is not, you know, I'm not the most experienced actor in the world, but in the things I've done so far, I feel like I've come through a cycle of being terrified to do anything and thinking that the best acting advice was do nothing. And, you know, if you have an impulse, then squash it and it's wrong. <laughs> and, you know, just, just be completely, completely plain. And in some cases, that's true. In some cases, oddly, due to some quirk of human psychology or how we recognize emotion, in some cases, we recognize a blank face as a number of different things and we laud amazingly subtle performances. But I, do, I think it's important to not feel stifled by that. And I'm now at a stage where I think, make a crazy choice and make do something do something interesting and, and hope that you have the skill that that will still come across as, as natural. And I think there's it has to exist somewhere between that because just doing nothing forever it's very stifling when you're on camera and even more stifling when you're on stage. It's called soap opera, right? You do nothing, right? Yeah, yeah, right. But how did American television differ from uh, British television? Um, 
because wasn't Pandora that was a an American production, right? That was that was an American production, yeah. Um, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't really. Not essentially about what we're being asked to do. I know it does in a multitude of ways, um, but I find that very difficult to keep a handle on. Like I know that the CW who who broadcast Pandora want different things than PBS who are broadcasting um, Hotel Portofino. I know that they have business plans and they they have they have ideas, but that's personally for me not my favorite way to interpret character and to work on a set. I find that kind of foggying and dizzying and and confusing and kind of gets in the way of me feeling comfortable and natural in things. So I think. The way I I see that is I let the director worry about that. I let the directors and the producers worry about what they're going to do, and I'll just try and be here on set and be as be as mindful of what I'm doing as possible, and hopefully that fits into what the people around me want. Um, I know I'm not saying they don't want different things, or that it doesn't differ, or that be um, you know English TV, the BBC is not different from um, you know stars or whatever. But I find I find it more useful for me to try and concentrate just on the microscopic well how does all the thing the social media how does that factor in because you hear about people who have like this huge social media following yeah getting roles and you're thinking wait a minute they have no talent what is this i always i always think that like i don't i don't have any big grudges against people getting cast from things not for them personally because if they want to do it and someone wants to give them a job then they're going to do it like anyone would I don't hate, I don't, I don't like, I don't have a lot of hate in the, for, be, for people around me, or even I might have envy sometimes if they get jobs that I want. But the way I feel, I kind of thought about social media a lot, but I'm not very good at it. I don't like it. I've never been one to tweet a lot. I do, I have an Instagram. I think I tried to delete it, but it's still up there. And I think my last post is from two years ago or something. Um, For a long time, I kind of, put a lot of stress on myself to get better at that. And then I realized that I don't really like it. And for me, the social media itself is quite damaging for my mental health. And that might be a good tool for getting cast. I know it helps. I know people want to cast people with big following, but considering I'm not good at that, I shouldn't beat myself up about it. And I should just let that, let that go. So when you look at a career, where would you like to see yours go? What would you, what would be the ideal direction for you? I'm not really sure anymore. Like, like I said, when I was younger, I had a much clearer idea of here comes here comes my Macbeth, <laughs> right? And they're right. <laughs> they're how wonderful! But now, like I was saying earlier, I've realised that things have opened up to such a degree in terms of the style of things I would be playing that I I find it much more difficult to predict that. I hope I am working, and I hope I am happy, <laughs> but I'd much rather think about my mental health being high my own positivity being high and me enjoying the work that I do and finding it interesting than I would think about um, exactly where I'm going to be. Because my, my experience has been that whenever whenever I imagine a job in a certain way, it doesn't always line up with um, the way I expect my well-being, uh, the place I expect my well-being to be at when I have that job. It's very easy to think, oh, when I get a TV job, I'll be very happy. And I don't think that's how my happiness has, has, always, um, has, has always moved. So... As long as I find it interesting, then, and I'm working, then that'll be. Do you plan that? You know, I always need to go back to the theater because that's where I feel most welcome. Or is that because didn't you do cabaret this last year? Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I love that show. I was very lucky to do cabaret th this this year. I my in t okay in terms of um in terms of my career, the question that you actually asked me before I started rambling is um I would like to be doing a mix of things. I would like my career to be continuously mixed. I would like to do some theater and some screen work. I would like to write. I find the diff the, the variation to be spicy and interesting and exciting. Um, and I find that thrilling. I think that's what I want out of a career rather than something, I don't, I don't have a particular magnetism back to the theater and that's where I want to spend my time forever. I just want to be varied and, and interesting and satisfying. Do you look at your great aunts career i mean come on she's had the most varied career of anybody do you look at that it's like a, a template for something like this yeah it would be unbelievable but few people have a career as amazing as that Robert, come on you know yeah right but it because look she did cabaret for god's sake yeah she did um famously very well 
<laughs> yeah. But you did too, so go for yeah, it. That's what they say. But no, I absolutely, if I can have a career that's half as, as, as wonderful as that, I'd be very happy.